Anna had been married for eight years before she met Vronsky. Anna made a good marriage, although she and her husband both didn't get married for love. Uh, Karin was forced to propose to Anna by her aunt. The aunt said to him that he had compromised Anna by his behavior. Karin didn't know what he had done, but he was a man of duty and he married Anna. Karenin was a man of a high social status. He was rich, his uh, career was of great importance to him. Everything in his life was measured by public interest, by the benefits for his career. They had lived in peace, without ups and downs. Karenin had been a caring husband. Their relationship had been steady. Anna had shared her ideas, feelings, problems with her husband. Alexei Karenin was a serious, a bit boring and a reserved person with an ironic sense of humor. His emotional intelligence, as it is called now, wasn't developed enough. The feelings of duty, order, following the rules, uh, religious and legal rules, compensated Karenin for this lack of emotional intelligence. Those norms and rules regulated his actions. When Anna met Vronsky, she couldn't forget him. She couldn't forget the feeling of joy that she experienced. Lev Tolstoy wrote that Alexei Vronsky had a good-natured, handsome, and extremely calm and determined face. Yes, Vronsky was successful with women. They would see his loving face. Kitty fell in love with Vronsky easily, Kitty Shcherbatskaya. Vronsky aroused powerful emotions and feelings in women. The feelings of joy, delight. I think that we should pay attention to this fact. Anna Karenina had the same feelings for Vronsky. Anna also attracted men. She was beautiful. But in addition to her beauty, she had tenderness in her appearance and in her behavior. And she attracted people by these features. The two charming, charismatic people, Anna and Vronsky, began drawing each other with the attraction of a magnet. Beside the feeling of joy and delight, Anna experienced fear to Vronsky. What else made her fall in love with Vronsky? I think her vanity. Yes, vanity. Her vanity wasn't vulgar, but she loved the sense of elation with her success among men, her success in the high society. The love of such a glamorous man as Vronsky intoxicated her. If Anna had been less vain, um, things would have fallen out otherwise for her. Uh, and here we can recollect Tatiana Larina from the Eugene Onegin poem by Pushkin, who was also a success in the high society, but um, lack of vanity prevented her, a married woman, from having an affair with Eugene Onegin. Anna, as well as many beautiful women, uh, had vanity. And this feature, of course, placed her at many risks in life. Apart from his charisma, Vronsky attracted Anna by his submission, his readiness to serve her as his mistress. This also fed her vanity. This, as Tolstoy puts it, seized her with a feeling of joyful pride. Anna subconsciously was seeking a meeting with Vronsky, uh, though she was asking him not to pursue her. At the beginning of his courtship, Anna said to Dolly, the wife of her brother Stephen, I often wonder why people conspire to spoil me. 
What have I done and what could I do? It means it's not me who do something wrong. Other people do me wrong. After the ball, where Kitty Shcherbatsky, being in love with Bronsky, saw him and Anna dancing, where Kitty realized his adoration for Anna, where, um, where Kitty felt completely crushed after that, Anna said to Dolly, but it wasn't really my fault. Truly it wasn't. Oh, perhaps only a little bit. She said it in a thin voice, drawing out the words a little bit. Bronsky and Anna felt a sense of joy, pride and fear of their aborning love. At the same time, Impenetrable stone walls started to grow between Anna and her, and her husband. A new sense came over Anna, a sense of aversion to her husband. She began to dislike his hands, his ears, his voice, and so on. Pay attention to the fact that Brodsky was not ashamed to pursue a married woman. As Tolstoy puts it, he knew perfectly well that there was no risk of his becoming ridiculous in the eyes of all fashionable people. He knew perfectly well that in their eyes the role of a disappointed lover of a girl or a single woman in general might be ridiculous, but the role of a man pursuing a married woman to draw her into an adulterous association that that role has something grand and beautiful and could never be ridiculous, could never be ridiculous in the high society. Karenin realized that there was something between his, between his wife Anna and Bronsky, but being a strong man in uh, state affairs, he was powerless here in this situation. Like an ox, his head bent meekly. He waited for the blow of the axe which was raised over him. He was a participant of that performance where the driving force was deceit, fear and evil. Tolstoy approached Karenin, Karenin for his cowardice, hesitancy. But Karenin didn't find it in its heart to talk frankly to Anna though there was still a hope of saving her. But Karenin behaved like many other deceived husbands and wives do. They usually keep silence and behave as if nothing wrong is happening. Why? Because the truth is too terrible, unbearable, and it is impossible to understand how to live on with this truth. I finish this mini lecture with the first sex of Anna and Bronsky. At that date, at their intimate date, they both felt shame. Anna felt guilty and humiliated. Tolstoy compared Bronsky with the murderer who had deprived his victim, Anna, of life, and that body had to be caught and hidden, for the murderer must enjoy the fruits of his crime. Anna said to Vronsky, It's all over. I have nothing left but you. Remember that. She realized that she had sacrificed her public status, her marriage, her son to this relationship. But she could do nothing. Something strange began to happen to her consciousness. I can call it splitting of her consciousness. As Tolstoy puts it, when she was asleep and had no control over her thoughts, her situation appeared to her in all its hideous nakedness. She had one and the same dream almost every night. She dreamed that both of them were her husbands and both made passionate love to her. And wondering why this seemed so impossible to her, she kept explaining to them, laughing, that that was much simpler and that now both of them were happy and contented. 
But this dream weighed on her like a nightmare and she woke up in terror. That was her psychological state. And in the next mini lecture, I'll talk about the next stage of Anna's life. It is called conflict.